Good day, Grey Tents. In this series, we are going to discuss the atom. But in order to do the, uh, that, we actually need to look at the history of the development of the atomic model. So let's start off in 400 BC with a Greek philosopher by the name of Democritus. Now in those days the philosophers were the scientists and mathematicians and chemists of the day. And they used to ask questions and try and solve what is going on in this world. And he asked, could matter be divided into smaller pieces forever? And he concluded that matter could not be divided into smaller and smaller pieces forever. Eventually, the smallest possible piece would be obtained. Now, remember, they didn't have microscopes in those days. So, obviously, if he took a piece of matter and chopped and chopped and chopped, he would get to a point where he couldn't see it anymore, which is why he probably thought that there was a smallest piece ever. And this piece would be indivisible, much like the little solid ball on the right-hand side of the screen here. He named the smallest piece of matter a Thomas, or a Thomas, which means indivisible or cannot be cut. And that's where we get our name of our atom these days. So he said that atoms were small, hard particles of different types. So for example, cheese had basic cheese particles and wood had basic wood particles. Now if you look at the timeline, you will see that there's quite a large delay from the Greek model in 400 BC to 1803 where the Dalton model came through. And there's a very significant reason. The reason are basically is based on these two gentlemen, Aristotle and Plato. These two gentlemen were also philosophers, but they were very, very popular with the kings and the royalty at the time, and they decided that they wanted to break the elements up and explain everything according to the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air. And because they were so popular, everybody bought into this, and it took until 1803 when an English chemist, John Dalton, started looking at Democritus's findings and looking at his readings and work that he published, because he did publish stuff, and he decided to perform a number of experiments that led to the acceptance of the idea of atoms. And if you look at his theory, you'll see it is very, very similar, if not identical, to Democritus's to theory. He said that all elements were composed of atoms, Atoms were indivisible and indestructible. Atoms of the same element are exactly alike. Atoms of different elements are different. And compounds are formed by joining the two atoms or the atoms of two or more elements. So you could see that very similar, if not exactly the same, to Democritus' theory. But what Dalton did do was that he drew up a table of what he thought different atoms would look like. So for example, he drew, it's just a symbol. So it'd be a symbol for hydrogen, nitrogen was a circle with a line through, carbon was a solid circle, oxygen an open circle. But they also knew in those days that, for example, water was made up of hydrogen and oxygen. So you will notice here that we've got hydrogen here and we've got an oxygen here. But you'll also notice that they didn't know that the atoms were in a specific ratio. They just knew that water was made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Next was Mr. J.J. Thompson. He was busy in 1897. He published his work and he was doing experiments as well and he was an English scientist and he was the first person to suggest that an atom is made up of even smaller particles. And again this was experimental. Thompson studied the passage of the electric current through a gas using a cathode ray tube. He noticed something very interesting. So let's watch this little video that explains it. Another scientist by the name of J.J. Thompson hypothesized that atoms are made up of even smaller particles. Thompson conducted experiments in which an electric current was passed through tubes pumped almost empty of air. You observe. What do you see when the electric current passes through the tube? light is given off. This light is created by rays traveling through the tube. 
Thompson observed that when a magnetic charge is introduced, the rays are deflected. Thompson reasoned that the rays were made up of negatively charged particles. Today, we call these negatively charged particles found in atoms electrons. Thompson also hypothesized that positively charged material existed in the atom. In his model of the atom, he proposed that an atom was made of a positively charged material in which negatively charged electrons were scattered. His model of the atom became known as the plum pudding model. He envisioned small electrons embedded in the atom, much like raisins embedded in a plum pudding. Right, so now let's summarize what Thompson's model was, what he found. He concluded that the negative charges come from within the atom. Therefore, there had to be a smaller particle than the actual atom. So therefore, the atom was divisible. Thompson called these negatively charged particles called puzzles, but today we know them as electrons. Since the gas was said to be neutral, or known to be neutral, which means it had no charge, if there were negatively charged particles, there obviously had to be positively charged particles in the atoms, but he could never find them. So he came up with the theory of the plum pudding model. He proposed a model of the atom that's sometimes called the plum pudding model or more recently the chocolate chip cookie model. He suggested that atoms were made of a positively charged substance with negatively charged electrons spread throughout, much like raisins in a pudding. Now, Ernest Rutherford came up in 1908 with a different experiment. He was also an English physicist. He came up with a gold foil experiment. Now, what you need to understand about this experiment before we show you the animation of it was that he took an alpha particle that just worked out radiation and radioactive materials and he took an alpha particle emitter. Now, alpha particles are really big particles and he shone them in a beam through a gold foil, a thin, thin sheet of gold foil, like thin as a tissue, onto a detecting screen. Now what you need to understand about this is that Rutherford actually designed this experiment to show his students that atoms existed. So what he expected to happen was that this was the equivalent of a cannonball being shot through tissue. He expected there to be a huge hole and there to be, and you will notice that he expected there to be a huge hole and then there would just be a big bright spot here. Okay, now let's see what actually happened. So here we've got the alpha particle emitter and it is showing the charged particles being radiated out. Now it goes through the circle and it hits the screen on the other side. Great, life is good, his experiment works. However, now they put the gold foil, no hole, look at that. And then what he noticed was, even more distressingly, that there were bright particles, bright spots being formed all different places around here. So what was happening was that some of the particles were going straight through, that's great, but some of them were being deflected. Now this is an animation of what we're about to explain, is that he realized that there had to be a nucleus. So let's talk about what he discovered and what he realized. Most of the positive charge bullets pass right through, they, he called them bullets, but they are all alpha particles. And most of the positively charged bullets pass right through the gold atom in the sheet of gold foil without changing course and it didn't make a hole. Some of the positively charged bullets however did bounce away from the gold sheet as if they had hit something solid and he knew that positive charges repel positive charges so that gave him a, gave him a hint. So now if you look at this diagram here on the right you'll basically see what he realized. This could only mean that gold atoms in the sheet were mostly open space. The only way the large alpha particles could pass through the atoms, the thin sheet, was if most of this was open space. So the atoms were not a pudding filled with positively charged material. They were mainly open space. He also concluded that the atom had a small, dense, positively charged center that repelled his bullets, his alpha particles. And he called the center of the atom the nucleus. So what he realized was that if he was shining a positively charged alpha particle 
onto this, the only way it could be reflected or deflected or even hugely deflected was if there was a center or a solid positively charged center and he called that the nucleus. But the nucleus is still tiny compared to the atom as a whole. So Rutherford's conclusions were obviously the atom is mainly made of space, that he reasoned that all of the atom's positively charged particles were contained in a nucleus, and the negatively charged particles were scattered outside the nucleus around the atom's edge. Now we get to Niels Bohr, and Niels Bohr was a very different man. He was published his work in 1913. He was a Danish scientist and he proposed a new model. So he did base his model on the previous findings, but he came up with a new theory. And his atomic model says this. According to his model, electrons move in definite orbits around the nucleus, much like the planets circle the sun. These orbits or energy levels are located at different or at certain distances from the nucleus. Now we are not going to explain to you how he came about this theory and we're not going to talk about different types of orbitals and that now. All you need to know is how, in, from this section is how the atomic model was developed and you need to know that we are now currently using a version of Bohr's atomic model. This is the very basic example of what we understand about the nucleus and about the atom at the moment. And that is that the nucleus is in the center and it's got positively charged protons in it. Okay, at the time they didn't know about the neutrons and then also we know that they are in a cloud around there. He thought they traveled through specific energy levels around the atom, I mean around the nucleus. Right, that is all for the atomic history. Thank you very much for joining me. Bye.